about a million years in the early Pleistocene epoch, from about 2.4 million to 1.4 million years ago, it was a really exciting time to be a hominin. Hominids, you'll recall, are the group of human ancestors that are more closely related to us than to chimps and bonobos. During this million year stretch, different branches of our evolutionary tree were flourishing all over southern and eastern Africa. And if we were to zoom in on the earliest part of this million years, we'd encounter a familiar face, or at least a somewhat familiar face, the face of Homo habilis. It stood just over a meter tall and had a slightly larger brain and smaller teeth than its earlier relatives, the Australopithecines. But it still had longer arms and a protruding lower face, traits that are usually considered more basal in the hominin lineage. And yet, this ancestor probably made and used stone tools. In fact, Homo habilis means handyman, and its discoverers gave it that name because they thought that it was responsible for the many tools that had been found near its remains. But does this hominin really belong in our genus, the genus Homo? Was it more like us than its earlier ancestors? Over the last 50 years or so, the human family tree has really filled out. We've discovered all kinds of new fossils of our ancestors and relatives like the Australopithecines that have about the same brain size and limb proportions as Homo habilis. And this has led some researchers to question whether Homo habilis is really a member of our genus at all. As more and more fossil ancestors have been found, our genus has become more and more inclusive, incorporating more members that look less like us, Homo sapiens. And this is an important problem to think about, because there's some consensus about who belongs in our immediate human family, like us, Neanderthals, and even the ancient globe-traveling hominin Homo erectus. They're all agreed to be clear-cut members of the genus Homo. But beyond them, there are lots of ancestors for whom we can't find a home. And there's no official definition of what constitutes a human either, whether that means being a member of our genus or our species or just being able to walk upright and make tools. So by getting to know these other hominins, the ones who came before us, the Neanderthals and our other contemporaries, we can start to answer some big, interesting and difficult questions. Questions about what it essentially means to be human. When the first fossils of Homo habilis were found by Lewis and Mary Leakey's team in the 1960s, they had a difficult choice to make. Were these the remains of Australopithecines, or were they in fact the earliest known members of our own genus Homo? Traditionally, defining who belongs in our genus has come down to which traits are considered uniquely human. And when the Leakeys were pondering Homo habilis, they used a definition of Homo from 1955, which said that to be a member of the genus, you had to have some number of features in common with the three members of Homo known at the time, Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, and the Neanderthals. The Leakeys decided that Homo habilis shared three important traits with other members of our genus. It had an upright posture, it was bipedal, and it had the manual dexterity to make tools. And sure, Homo habilis had those three things. But in the decade after Homo habilis was found, new discoveries of other human ancestors were made in the same parts of Africa, and they had those traits too. And these new finds were all various Australopithecines, which were inarguably not part of our genus. The most famous of these discoveries is the specimen known as Lucy. Unearthed at Hadar, Ethiopia in 1974, she was one of the most complete specimens of Australopithecus afarensis ever found. And she gave clear evidence of an upright posture, like having thigh bones that angled inwards towards the knee and a more human-like pelvis. Then, four years later, a set of fossilized footprints were found in Tanzania. Known as the Laetoli footprints, they were probably made by Australopithecus afarensis too, again showing that hominid were walking on two feet more than a million years before Homo habilis was around. So if walking upright was not exclusive to our genus, then the definition of our genus had to change. Instead of just physical traits, the thinking then turned towards lifestyle adaptations as a way of defining who belonged in our group. Lifestyle adaptations are features that are linked to how a hominin lived its life, like what it ate, how it got around, and where it lived. For example, the increased brain size in members of Homo was thought to be linked to a higher quality diet, because being able to consume more calories more efficiently has allowed for larger brains. And some researchers arrived at four specific lifestyle adaptations that they thought might qualify a hominin for entry into the genus Homo. Those adaptations included an adult brain size greater than 600 cubic centimeters, limb proportions similar to ours with long legs compared to our arms, the use of language, and the manufacture and use of stone tools. 
But still, these things only kind of apply to Homo habilis. Because one of the most famous and complete Homo habilis skulls, a specimen known as KNMER1813, had a cranial capacity of only 510 cc's. Meanwhile, a big male specimen of Australopithecus afarensis was found to have limb proportions like those of early members of Homo, but it lived 3.58 million years ago, way before Homo habilis appeared on the scene. And the capability for language can really only be inferred from the fossil record. It's pretty hard to tell whether Homo habilis or any ancestor that lived millions of years ago was able to speak. That just leaves stone tools, and while researchers in the 1960s were pretty convinced that Homo habilis was the maker of the stone tools at Olduvai Gorge, we now know that Australopithecines could likely make stone tools too. So let's look at our group another way. Instead of talking about who might not belong to our genus, let's consider who might. Who were those other members of our genus that lived alongside Homo habilis during that exciting million year span in Africa? And what can they tell us about the origin of the Homo genus? Well, starting about 1.98 million years ago in South Africa, there lived an Australopithecine with distinctly Homo-like traits. Known from several relatively complete skeletons, it was given the name in 2010 of Australopithecus sediba. Its discoverers placed it in Australopithecus because of its small brain and long arms, but they also noted that it had small molars and premolars and facial features that were similar to other Homo specimens. So these researchers actually think that Australopithecus sediba might be more closely related to our genus than other Australopithecines are, but other experts think that it's too recent in age. Another candidate for inclusion? Homo rudolfensis. It's been found at sites dating back 1.8 to 1.9 million years ago in Eastern Africa. The best fossil of this species is known as KNMER1470, and when it was discovered in 1972, it was originally classified as a large specimen of Homo habilis. However, in 1986 and again in 1992, further studies found that its bigger brain, longer face, and larger premolars and canines made it too different from Homo habilis to be a member of that species. But it was still assigned to our genus because of its big brain. At 775 cubic centimeters, it was well over the classic 600 cc cutoff. And finally, we come to the first indisputable member of our genus and one of the most successful and widespread, Homo erectus. It lived from 1.9 million to just 143,000 years ago. The first Homo erectus fossils were found in 1891, and some anthropologists later split the species into two, with Homo erectus including the later African and Asian fossils and the earlier African fossils being filed under Homo ergaster. And experts generally agree that Homo erectus is definitely a member of our genus. These hominins had modern human-like proportions, were potentially capable of long-distance running, and generally had much smaller molars and much larger brains than their predecessors. In other words, they were a lot more like us than any of the other species I've mentioned so far. Homo erectus is also the first species that we have fossil evidence for outside of Africa. They made it as far as China and Indonesia, but their initial foray seems to have landed them in the Republic of Georgia, at a site called Damanisi that dates to about 1.77 million years ago. And the interesting thing about this site is that there's a lot of variation among the specimens found there. Some individuals from Dominici had the unmistakable brow ridge of Homo erectus, but their brains were smaller than 600 cc's, that classic cutoff for inclusion into the genus Homo. In fact, there's so much variation in the Georgian fossils that their discoverers made a case in 2013 for taking all of the other early Homo fossils, including the ones assigned to Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis, and putting them in Homo erectus, lumping everything together as a single species. They argue that if the fossils from a single site can show as much variation as we find between species, then all of those early groups might as well be considered the same species. But of course, other experts disagree. They don't think overall cranial shape is enough to distinguish one species from another. To them, the devil is in the differing morphological details of each skull. Now with all this in mind, let's go back to Homo habilis. Where does it belong? Well, it doesn't really seem to fit anyone's definition of our genus, and the best argument for keeping it in is just that taking it out would require redefining what it means to be a member, which would be a major taxonomic undertaking. Some experts have proposed lumping habilis into the genus Australopithecus. Others say it's neither and that it deserves its own new genus. So far, no single opinion has won out. Homo habilis remains a taxon in limbo. 
Ultimately, what defines our genus comes down to how much variation in morphology, time, and space we're willing to include in the group we call home. In the past, an increase in brain size, a bipedal gait, human-like limb proportions, and tool use seemed to have been enough for inclusion. Those are all things that we thought made us members of the same genus. But as we've discovered more and more hominin fossils, our family tree has become more complicated rather than less. So now the latest research is suggesting totally new ways of defining our lineage. One new idea for a defining feature of our genus, tooth size. Smaller teeth generally indicate a higher quality diet and the ability to prepare food with tools instead of having to chew tough foods for a long time. Another possible criterion is the pace of our development. We modern humans have longer periods of childhood and adolescence compared to our closest ape relatives because we need that time to grow our large brains and use them to learn. And we can track these growth patterns in the fossils by studying microscopic features of teeth. And as recently as 2015, some experts have suggested that we should scrap the whole list of hominins altogether and just start from scratch. They say we should step back and look at the totality of the fossil record with fresh eyes and decide what traits we think are are important for being human. As it stands, there's still no single way to define our genus. Mostly it happens by comparison. Is this new fossil more like what we've called Homo in the past, or is it more like an Australopithecine? And the jury's still out on Homo habilis, the species that started all the trouble in the first place. But if anything, the trouble really began back in the early Pleistocene, during that exciting million years or so when this group of hominins first started to flourish. And it may be in the fossils from that time, perhaps fossils we haven't even found yet, that will help us better answer the question of who belongs to our very exclusive group. Thanks as always, and an extra big thanks to our current eontologists, Jake Hart, John Ivey, John Davidson Ng, and Steve. If you'd like to join them and our other patrons in supporting what we do here, then go to patreon.com slash eons and make your pledge. Now, what do you want to learn about? Leave us a comment and don't forget to go to youtube.com slash eons and subscribe.